Well, listen, y'all. Genesis 1, right? Aren't you enjoying this book? Well, we've been in it two weeks and we went two, through two verses. <laughs> We're going to go a lot faster today, so we will be picking up speed from here. What's the hurry? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> One day at a time. That's our little lesson. Now, did you get a, did everybody get a handout to find them back there? Everybody good? Okay. Very good. One day at a time. Uh, well, consider the existence of water. Water. It's good stuff right here, right? Do you know how amazing water is? I mean, it really is amazing. Water has a host of unique properties that are absolutely indispensable for life. Um, here's an example. It's the only known substance whose solid phase is less dense than its liquid phase. It's the only known substance whose solid phase is less dense than its liquid phase, which means what? When it's in its solid phase, it floats. Yeah. Yeah. So ice forms on top of the lakes and top of the oceans, which allows marine life to live underneath them instead of the, instead of the ice being on the bottom where they are. It also, on a microscopic level, has uh, something unique. The molecules exhibit, exhibit what's called a hydrophilic effect which gives water the unique ability to shape proteins and nucleic acids that are critically important for DNA. And on the microscopic level, that's just water. Um, from a molecular standpoint, here's what Michael Corey says. He says, the very properties of water are nothing short of miraculous. No other compound even comes close to duplicating its many life-supporting properties. How amazing that even the makeup of water points to our amazing creator. Amen. Yeah. The water points to how miraculous, how powerful he is to create. And we have, we've discussed the um, <clears throat> sovereignty of God. We've looked at lessons we can learn from that. Pastor Sam did a marvelous, masterful apologetic on the seven reasons to believe uh, in God last week. I, I was, I don't know about you, but I was listening on the edge of my seat as he presented some really powerful truths. That was good stuff, brother. Very good stuff. Uh, revealing to us um, scientific proofs of why evolution is nothing more than you lost humanity's fraud attempt to deny the one they are accountable to. I mean, that's, it's, so, its sole purpose is to is to deny accountability. Uh, if, if there is no creator, then I'm accountable to no one, and I am my own God, which is the whole, which is the sin of the Bible from day one, as we'll find out, or sometime after day one or day seven. <laughs> We'll get to that in a minute. But, super job Pastor Sam did on that. Well, the reality is, Moses, Moses writes chap this chapter as an apologetic. It is written to be an apologetic in narrative prose. And it's not an exhaustive account of creation. How could it be? It's a page long. So, in other words, it doesn't cover everything there is to cover in the creation account. But Gleason Archer says, Moses presents the creation story as what actually happened in time, space, and the world we experience. So it's not exhaustive, but it is written as history. What did happen? Um, now keep in mind that when Moses writes this, he's the author, where is the time frame? Where is he at when he writes? Because he's writing about things that happened in the past by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Moses is writing this uh, right after the nation of Israel leaves Egypt <clears throat> after 400 years of captivity. And under 400 years in that captivity, they have been under a nation um, as slaves who worshipped a creation and had a pantheon of gods. Um, so they've been 400 years under a nation where who worships, well they had a god for everything. There's a sun god and a moon god and a water god and a vegetable god and this is every kind of God you can imagine, the pantheon. And what Moses does in this apologetic, of course, this Genesis account attacks every single one of them as false gods, not gods at all. Now, the creation account, as we go forward from verse 3, has two patterns. There are two patterns to it. God forms, then he fills. Okay? Um, first three days, God is going to form some special places, and in the last three days of creation, he's going to fill them. What's also interesting and unique uh, is that those days correspond to each other. Uh, the, the first three days, 
uh, correspond to the last three days specifically. So day one to day four, day two to day five, day three to day six. So for example, in day one, God creates light. He forms light. In day, in day four, corresponding day, he fills it with luminaries. Okay, you follow me? Okay, so day two, he forms the sky and the water, and in day five, he fills it with birds and fish. It's a corresponding day. Day three, he forms the land, and day six, he fills it with animals and humanity. Okay, day seven is a whole unique day we'll get to at the end of the chapter. It has no corresponding day. Meant to be different on purpose. There's also something unique here that we don't pick up in our English translations that's really powerful uh, in Hebrew. And that is the numerical harmony of multiples of seven. Why is seven important to know? <clears throat> yeah, we, we know it is God's perfect number, right? And it's all over the place in this chapter. Um, Hebrew University professor Umberto Casado points, points that out. I want to give him credit for, for showing these things to us. So let me share some of them with you. Uh, the three standalone verbs in verse, or nouns, I'm sorry, in verse one, God, heavens, and earth, those three standalone, because they're not in a prepositional phrase or anything, those three standalone nouns, for example, appear in multiples of seven throughout the chapter. God is found 35 times, that's five times seven. The heavens are found 21 times, that's three times seven. The word earth is found 21 times, that's three times seven. In Hebrew, the first verse, verse 1, in Hebrew, not in English, in Hebrew, has seven words. Verse 2, in Hebrew, has 14 words. Seven times two. The seventh paragraph has three sentences, each having seven words containing the middle phrase, the seventh day. Three times. Casuto points out, he says, this numerical symmetry is, is, as it were, the golden thread that binds together all the parts of the section and serves as a convincing proof of its unity. Some neat stuff in this book, right? <clears throat> now, deists believe, evolutionists, we've discovered that, we'll talk about a little bit again, a little bit more later, as we well know, um, and we've talked about, and that's now taught everywhere, <clears throat> uh, believe that well, we'll get to it in a minute, right? Everything just evolved. No, no creator, happenstance, survival of the fittest, etc., etc. There's another group called deists. Um, and, and deists would make room for evolution. It's not necessarily that they do or that they did, but they can. Um, and, and they would believe that, that they do. They believe there's a God and he created the universe and then spun it into motion and let it go. And it's completely disconnected from it. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. So he believed in God, but he did not believe God engaged with creation. God, he just made it and then let it go. Doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with it. <clears throat> but that's not what Scripture teaches. And that's not what this chapter teaches us. God is not only the creator, but he has an intimate relationship with his creation. Which is, completely, which is revealed intimately in chapter 1. What is God's involvement in creation? Well, there's at least three implications we'll point out this evening of God's involvement. And the first is that he designed it. God is the designer of creation. Now, I just mentioned evolution a minute ago. Pastor Sam talked about him and it <clears throat> last week as well. Uh, Charles Darwin, as you know, um, he studied medicine. Uh, I mentioned this in the first lesson, I think. He studied medicine, then he studied, studied for the clergy. Uh, his father could never figure out what to do with him because he wouldn't stick to something very long. Uh, so <clears throat> he failed in medical school. And so then his dad suggested, encouraged him to become a pastor. And before he goes to clergy school, he takes a sailing adventure. In all of his, sa his sailing adventure, <clears throat> Darwin writes down his interpretations of whatever he sees. And uh, he's writing down his interpretations of what he's visually seeing on this sailing adventure between medical and clergy school. By the way, he didn't finish that either. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> one of the works of course, as you well know, it's called The Origin of the Species, 1859. He did not invent the idea of evolution. Darwin didn't invent it. He just popularized it. Yeah. And he argued that organisms develop from simple to complex structures through natural and random causes. In other words, new species develop, not just adaptation. And for evolution to be true, that is what has to happen. You can't have just adaptation. New species must develop. 
Survival of the fittest would determine the answer to that, of course, or how it would work. It would determine which ones are going to continue in that evolutionary process, and that theory is called natural selection, which eventually caught the attention of those who would not espouse creation, and that, therefore, they make it popular. Yet, as the principle, the major principles, the major principles in evolution are faulty and can't be proven. Sam wonderfully went over that. I don't have to go into all those details. You've got a ton of stuff last week that are good, good, good arguments. And, uh, and, and basically, as we walked out of that, as you well know, um, from what was presented to us, there's no, listen, there is no scientific experiment that has ever been able to prove its hypothesis, not, not one. Did you follow that? Okay. It is presented as a scientific truth that is scientifically impossible to prove. It is presented to our world, to our kids, to our in universities, to you as a scientific proof, yet it is scientifically impossible to prove. It is. It cannot be. In fact, the laws of science, as Pastor Sam wonderfully shared last week, contradict it. Sugar beets have genetically, yes, been bred to increase the sugar content from 6 to 17 percent, but they're still sugar beets. <coughs> Nothing can create new genes, and you have to have that for evolution to be true. A bird cannot be bred to grow fur. A mouse can't be bred to grow feathers. A pig can't be bred to grow wings, even if we want them to fly. <coughs> And using chemicals and radiation on fruit flies, yeah, which has been one of those, hey, look at this, has only produced mutated flies with different colors and hair content. Guess what? They're still fruit flies. No new species has ever been created. As Francis Schaeffer used to argue, suppose a fish evolves lungs. What happens then? Does it move up the next evolutionary stage? Of course not. It drowns. <laughs> now some would say, okay, but the truth is, it's because you need thousands of years for that to develop and happen. You know what you've just done in making that statement? You've just declared evolution as a theory because you cannot prove it as a scientific fact. Now, <clears throat> Sam said last week that the variety and complexity of creation points to an intelligent designer, indeed, who is ultimately involved in his work. And we're going to read uh, the details of the text. We'll read into the text later, just presenting the, the general um, argument, if you will, now, or this aspect of design is that you will see as we read it in the next point. But God designed his involvement, his, his intimacy in it. He designed the atmosphere. He, designed the, he designs the land. He designs the sea. He designs the air. He designs the sun, the environment for which light makes things grow. He designs the creatures for the sky, creatures for the land, creatures for the air, as I mentioned, and the sea. He designs each, as you will notice, after their kind. Right? You want to note that. That's important. So let's hear for a reason. Verse 12. Note that in verse 12. <clears throat> Even the plants after the trees after their kind. Verse 21. The sea creatures and the birds of the air will reproduce. How? According to their kind. Okay? Not new genetics. Not new species, but according to... They reproduce. They're reproductive. Procreation, but... Each according to its kind, Scripture says. Verse 24, the animals. Each according to its kind. Um, and then humanity is a whole different thing we'll look at later. <clears throat> each according to its kind. He designed all of that. Each species produces or procreates their own. They do not involve, evolve into new species according to Scripture. And then God designs at the end the crown of his work, humanity. And unique above all in creation, he designs them, humanity, in his image to carry out his purpose of servanthood. He even designs them for a special unity or oneness um, as husband and wife. The rest of creation doesn't experience any of those things. 
They're only given to humanity. Does anybody know what pantheism is? <clears throat> pantheism is a worldview. It's a philosophy. A very popular one. <clears throat> millions and mi millions and millions of people adhere to. <clears throat> pantheism is a philosophical view that claims that God and creation are one and the same. Um, they're absorbed together as one. It confuses creation with God. You, okay? Propo who, who, where, where's that coming from? Creation, God, one and the same. Well, proponents of that include Hinduism. There's a lot of Hindus. Okay, Hinduism is pantheism. All right? God and creation are one and the same. <clears throat> Buddhism is pantheism. Its ultimate worldview is pantheism. New, the New Age movement, American Indian religions, they're all, it's pantheism. Creation and God are the same. Okay? Disney is a massive promo pr promoter of pantheism. Um, Star Wars, Avatar, uh, Disney's cartoon Pocahontas, they're all built around New Age or pantheism is the thread that runs through them all. Uh, Shirley MacLaine, John, ben, Don, John Denver, all proponents of pantheism. Folks, <clears throat> listen, God and creation are not the same. God is the antecedent of creation. He is separate from it. He is outside of it. We've covered that in the last two weeks. He created it. <clears throat> he created everything. Folks, listen. He created space. He created time itself. He is outside of everything in creation. There was, listen, there was only God. Every element or thing we could even come up with, there was only God. Separate from it. Outside of it. The creature and the creator are not the same. But, listen, but, even though he's separate from it, he is intimately involved in it. Personally involved in the process. He did not spin it into motion and let it go. Eight times in this chapter, God said. <clears throat> and the only tool he uses in creation is what? His word. That's all he needs. To just speak it into existence. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. He spoke everything into existence. And there is such an intimacy. See, he didn't have to. I mean, he didn't have to. He could have just done everything at one time. You follow this? He, he can do it any way he wants. He's God. He's all-powerful. But he's intimately involved in the elements, in the pieces of it. You follow this? He doesn't need seven days or six. He don't need one. He don't even... He doesn't even need seconds. Well, by the way, seconds and days don't even exist when he's there before any of this. He creates that too. <clears throat> so he doesn't need any of those things. He creates all of that, folks, but he is intimately involved in it because he walks through the process. He speaks it into existence. And he knows every aspect of creation, every detail of it. I like the way Ken Hughes describes it. He says, in creating everything through his word, God's thought shaped itself exactly to the least cell in Adam. That vast universe was shaped by his thought and will, as was each of the trillions of cells in our bodies. That's, now listen, that's not pantheism. God des designed it and he distributed it. We don't worship the creator, as Sam said last week. But we see the power of God in creation. His mind created it. So when you look at creation, you are coming to know some things about God. Because his mind made it. Psalm 19.2 says, Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. What did the psalmist say? All you have to do is look, and you'll see God. He says in, 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 uh, in the first verse, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. To walk outside after a while and look up, it is telling you something about God. His mind created it through his spoken word. And their expanse, he says in the rest of verse 1, the psalmist says, their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. He designed creation. He distributes creation. <clears throat> The slant of the earth is at an, a specific angle. Anybody know what it is? <clears throat> no? Anybody remember science class? <clears throat> it's critically important. It can't move. It has to stay this way or everything's dead. 23 degrees. 23 degrees. Yeah, it's 23 degrees. Did y'all Google that on your phone? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... 
<laughs> All right. 23 degrees. If it, listen, if it changed a fraction, the vapors of the ocean would move north and south, piling up the continents with ice. If the moon moved closer to the earth, what would happen? That's right. The continents would be overwhelmed by tidal waves. Everything works unique and specific. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton, you ever heard of him? Here's what he said. He says, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. The chances against such an ordered cosmic machine just happening are overwhelming. Johannes Kepler is the founder of modern astrology. He is the discoverer of the three planetary laws of motion, and he is the one who, made, who originated the term satellite. He said, the undevout astronomer is mad. <laughs> Now, as we read through this account, you will see and notice that our account is, our, the account, the description is geocentric. What that means is, it says that it's someone is standing on the earth looking up or looking out. So it's from earth's perspective. Now, we should, I shared this with you in, in week one, it's theocentric in focus, and, but it's geocentric in description. What I mean by that? Well, it means that theocentric means God's the center of the focus. Right? The word God's the primary character the reader's supposed to focus on. God appears 35 times in this chapter. The name God. So it's theocentric in his focus. He's who it's all about. But it's geocentric in his description. So the author is looking at what God is doing, but he's looking at what God is doing from his position on the earth, which would make perfect sense as Moses writes it. He's not on the moon. Okay? <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Now, there are two patterns, as I mentioned. There are first three days God forms, and then he fills in the corresponding final three days. There are six divisions. Each is demarcated by the phrase, there was evening and there was morning, and then that was a certain day. Okay, So that phrase, evening and morning, they mark six days, or six divisions, I should say. Okay, ready? Let's, let's, so let's look into them. Day one, final verses three and five. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was evening, and there was morning, day one. God's first word is to bring forth light. And I love this. This is so cool. So, for the first three days, light is visible without a designated source. There's no sun yet. He doesn't make it until we get to the next corresponding day, which is day four. Okay, <clears throat> y'all follow that? There's light. There's no sun. And some might say, "Well, that doesn't make sense. How can it be light without the sun?" Well, the sun ain't shining out of your flashlight when you turn it on after a while, <clears throat> is it? Light doesn't need the sun to exist, and it doesn't need your flashlight to exist either, <laughs> <laughs> or from whatever other source light comes from. Light in and of itself. The text is implying the light's, listen, the light's source is God himself. That's right. Okay? God creates light, but his source is him. And that's not unusual to us if we're students of the scripture, right? How often does God reveal himself as light in scripture? Over and over and over again when he chose to reveal himself, that's the most common way he did. Was light. Now, I love this. This is so awesome. The Bible begins with light, but there's no sun and there's no moon, and it ends the same way. Revelation 22, verse 5. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. It begins and ends the same way. There is light, but we don't need the sun or the moon to give it to us. He is the source of that light. And the scripture says God names them. And he's going to do that over again. And naming something indicated one's authority or sovereignty. So you name something, you have authority over that. My bird dog's name is Joy. I gave it to her. I have authority over Joy. She didn't choose her name, I gave it. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so to the Hebrew people, that name indicated something that your character, or if he was a person, it meant it represents your character, or it was something else, it, re it represented what you are, your description. And naming something represented authority. God does so. Now let's look at the corresponding day four. To get to day four, you look at verse 14. 
And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years. Okay, now the wheel begins to spin so that we can measure. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, day four. So God makes the sun, he makes the, new, the moon, he makes the stars, basically the celestial luminaries. This is interesting, the stars get a phrase. Just one phrase. God made the stars. There they are. <laughs> now why does he only give the stars a phrase? Because we look at them and go, oh my word. There's, wow, what's out there? Well, that's because that's not God's focus. Nor is it to be ours. He's, he's fine-tuning his focus towards something. Right? The, then that's towards what's going on down here. This is his focus. The sun is set in our galaxy. The earth begins to orbit the sun with the moon orbiting the spinning earth like a perfectly calibrated watch, as Scripture begins to explain here. And God says what? This is good. And that is an indication of His judgment and satisfaction, which of course means He's judge. He declares what's good and what's not. Now, before we go any further, I want to address something briefly. I'm not going to spend train loads of time on it. Um, I actually don't think we need to. But one of them, some of them, it may jump out at you, and it has obviously to many. And that is, okay, the sun is created in day four, but yet we have the phrase evening and morning on day one. So how do we have, and we also have the word day, combined with evening and morning, day one, and we have, the, the, so what's going on here, because... If the sun's not created today four, how do we have evening and morning? Okay, that's a logical question. And there are at least six different conservative views on how on the answer to that question. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to spend all the rest of this time discussing all six of them. Most of them focus on the meaning of the word day, which is in the Hebrew is yom. Jewish days begin. Why is evening listed first? Because this is Jew this is who wrote this? Moses did, right? So it's from a Jewish perspective, and the Jewish day began in the evening, not the morning. So <clears throat> that's how it's described. So how could evening and morning indicate a day without the sun? Well, <clears throat> the day of time is for us is determined how? By the rotating of the earth on its axis in a frame of 24 hours. Right? So... Could, Listen to me. That thing's spinning. We know it's connected to the orbit of the sun. But can God spin the earth without the sun if he wants to? He can do anything he wants to do. Can he not? Okay. So, I'm good with that. Um, <clears throat> Moses could have been using the reference evening and morning the first. Remember when he writes this, all this is in place. So he could have been doing that as a reference to the 24-hour frame. Dave, by the way, has in his book, has written a great description and explanation and a good argument on that is one of, if not the most popular among conservative creationists as to the day, word day, meaning and being a 24-hour period. I have no problem with that. That is the way that I lean in the direction that I go. <clears throat> other conservative Bible scholars point to some other uses of the word yom or day in the Old Testament. Specifically, its use in Psalm 90. And the reason they would focus Psalm 90 at the use of the word yom, as well as the word evening and morning, which are also found in that book, is that Moses wrote Psalm 90. And so the same author writes both, and yet he uses those two, all three of those phrases in different phases of time than he does in chapter 1. So they would state that, therefore, yom does not, and in Hebrew I study Hebrew, and no, it does not always have to mean a 24-hour period. If that's the case, could this be something else? And they would argue it's specific phases of time. All right, that would, of course, point me to the question. I'm only answering this for me. I'm not answering this for Sam or Dave. They, would have diff they may and can well have different answers. Do I believe it's a 24-hour period as we know it? Yes. Am I 100% absolutely certain of it? No, I'm not 100% certain. Most, but, 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 but here's the reality of it. I don't have to be. And I'm good with that. 
I don't know when Jesus is coming back either. I'm good with that. <laughs> I just know he is. Amen. Amen. Okay? It's what it says. So, he, he, l let me state it this way. I hope this helps you. Yeah, it's the way that I believe. But I'm, I'm okay if I'm wrong. And here's why. Most arguments on this subject matter of this, of this word, specifically the word day, are either made to dismiss or make room for evolution. And that's why we argue over it. But the reality is, evolutionists don't believe the rest of the chapter anyway. Much less the rest of the Bible, so they don't need the argument. So, what that would mean for us is that creation, listen, creationists don't need it either. Now, why is that? Because evolution says everything developed by natural selection and happenstance. The whole rest of the chapter denies that. It all denies it. Listen, God spoke it into existence and established the species within their kind. I don't have to make room for evolution in a time frame. Because it already says it didn't happen that way. By the way that it did happen. So for me, listen, 24 hours or 24 years or 24 seconds doesn't make any difference to the truth. And the truth is God intentionally and intimately created it by his word. Amen. Period. And scripture's clear on that. So we, we can address it. It's good that we do. We should seek an answer to it. That's fine. And, we, and we, we need to come up with that answer. But listen to me carefully. Our whole theology of creationism and salvation is not based on this one word. Amen. And it's meaning. If it is, we in trouble. <laughs> it's not. And listen, we as believers, we surely don't need to be arguing over it. All right? Any, again, any more than we would argue over the timing of Jesus' coming. We don't know that either. We just know that he is. Okay? I took a little aside, but that's a very, very popular issue. <laughs> okay? It makes sense. It's a good question, relevant to be asked. But, <clears throat> I don't think it's the key issue of the chapter. Uh, again, you read Dave's book, he's got some good arguments in that as well. Um, <clears throat> day number... Two, verse 6. God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. I'm reading the standard version. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were, now here's a description of waters from waters, that were under the expanse from waters and those that were above the expanse. And it was so, God called the expanse heaven and there was evening and there was morning. Day two. God formed the expanse, which is described as a horizontal boundary separating the surface waters, waters down here, with me, from waters above. Is there waters above? Yeah, you've been watching them fall for a couple of days. <clears throat> there are waters above, clouds. Okay, with me? God created this, basically what he's telling us here is God creates the structure of the atmosphere. Now remember, what's the focus of the writer? It's geocentric, meaning that the writer is describing this from some from the view of where, from Earth. Okay, so it's a so to the, to the one on Earth, it is a visible expanse through of which one sees the birds, and the, they see the clouds, they see the stars. It just keeps going. You follow me? Okay, they see all of that through that. So heavens is translated sky. It's the expanse above which goes beyond what is immediately visible. So you can see into it, but it keeps going. It's geocentric. So we see the birds and we see the clouds, but it extends beyond the in, into the invisible. Now, corresponding day five. So God forms that. And corresponding day five is found in verse, beginning in verse 20. God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above them across the expanse of the heavens. And so, God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, with which the waters swarm, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, said, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the waters and the seas, let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening, there was morning, the fifth day. God fills the waters and the sky with life. He designed everything that lives. It, it covered it all. From the big whales to everything in between. Anything and everything that lives in the water and everything that flies in the sky, God made. 
damn mosquitoes too. <laughs> they just didn't harm people back then. <laughs> Which we'll get to in a whole other, we'll get to that in a few more lessons. Day three, verse nine. God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place. Let the dry land appear. It was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and saw it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit with their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their kinds, trees bearing fruit in which their seed according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day. Now he forms the land. He separates the oceans by forming the land. And the theme begins to move, move from the first three days of forming to the last three days of filling. He's preparing the earth to be habitable. And he establishes the productivity to produce vegetation. That takes us to day six. That's the corresponding day found in verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creeping things, beasts according to their kinds. And it was so. And this carries us all the way through the rest of the chapter. So God makes the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, livestock according to theirs, everything that creeps in the earth. And God saw it was good. And he said, let us make man in our own image and our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created, and male and female he created them, and he blessed them. And he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that's on the face of all the earth, every tree with seed for fruit. You shall have them for food. To every beast of the earth, to every bird of the heavens, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, there was morning, the sixth day. <clears throat> so now God fills the land with land creatures. The categories that he gives us are generic. They're meant to be. Um, in other words, he's not going to describe every single one of them. <laughs> Fill the whole rest of the book. Um, livestock. So what he's going to do is, he's, remember, this is Moses' writing. So Moses is going to use terms they understand. Livestock meant domesticated animals. So he's saying God made all the domesticated animals. Creeping things made, represented all kinds of manner of smaller animals. Basically everything else. But to them, beasts represented wild game. So what's that mean? The three categories to the Jewish people meant everything. All of it. Domesticated, wild, but we still hunt them, if you will, and every, anything and everything else that moves. He made it. And he did this to prepare the earth for his final creation. Humanity. Now, did you notice that the narrative radically slows down when you hit that one? Okay, it comes almost to a halt. We've been running pretty fast through what he's creating each part of it, but when he gets to this one, when he gets to humanity, the crown of his creation, the narrative slows down. Um, in fact, to discuss that, we'll take a whole other message just to go back over that creation of humanity. So we can't, we can't we have a time to cover tonight. It's too big. Um, and then we're going to move on from there and focus on that. <clears throat> but we do want to note that that's the end of it. That's the crown of his creation. That's what he's been getting to. Humanity is. And he makes humanity to have a special place in his creation, to have a special relationship with him made in his image, telling us he cares about us deeply, and to be a steward of his work, which is already described here, which means he deeply cares about us and his creation. Now, from this point, before we move into the last one, there, there's two principles I want to, uh, to point out to you, two, two big points that I really want you to walk away from. And really, there's a whole bunch of them, which couldn't cover all the major points. I just want to give you two big ones to, to think about. And the first is that God established the principle of separation. He establishes in this chapter the principle of separation. Did you note that? Light from darkness, night from day, water from sky... Land from waters. Did you catch all? There's division all the time. He's, there's principles of separation, which he will maintain. And still is. There are things you do and you don't do. <laughs> Establish day one. He imposes limit, limitations. And he imposes limitations in the creative account through self-maintained systematic categories. In other words, each after its kind. 
He put each kind in its prescribed finished form. They do not evolve. Kenneth Matthews, theologian, says, The great architect of the universe does not permit the colors of his canvas to run together. <laughs> Folks, God still works that way. He still, he still, listen, he still places people where he desires. He's still distributing creation, if you will. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, God has placed the members, each of them, in the body, the church, just where he desired. He's still doing it. And his distribution represents and reveals his involvement. In other words, he isn't the creation, but he's intimately involved in it. And listen, he's involved in your life. Every detail of your life he cares about. Every critical part. He doesn't just save you and then wait till you get to heaven to check in. He's still involved in his creation. Specifically his children. The crown of his creation. The second thing I want you to, to think on, <clears throat> major principle, is this. Jesus Christ is the creator that brings light and life. And John picked this up by way of the Holy Spirit. Folks, everything was made by Jesus. Okay? Listen, John 1, 1 through 4. Let me just read it for the sake of time. I just want to get to the last point. So write, write that down if you don't have that note. In the beginning... Sounds very similar to chapter 1 of Genesis, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the what? Light of men. We know John goes on to say the Word was made flesh. And in our first lesson, we discussed that creative agent of was of the Trinity was Jesus, the Word. How did God make creation? He spoke it, right? John picks up on the reality by the way of the whole, by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Word who brings life and light. He makes everything. When the Jews were celebrating, this is awesome. When the Jews were celebrating the Shekinah glory of God that led Israel out of the wilderness, they were in this great Massive festival whereby the great light, if you will, that led them everywhere. Remember, God manifested himself in light, led them out of Egypt, led them through the wilderness, led them in the promised land, shine a glory that descended upon the temple into the Holy of Holies. They're celebrating that in the illumination of the temple. And Jesus stands up in the midst of that ceremony and says what? I love it. He says what in John 8, 12? I am the light. I'm that light. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk, walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And when we are in the New Jerusalem, here's what the Bible says in Revelation 21, 23. That city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Folks, anyone who wants to have the light of eternal life can have it by turning to its source, and that's Jesus. Jesus, the light of life, is right here in chapter 1. And he will be in Revelation 21. When it's all wrapped up, he's the source of light and life. Now, finally, really, we, we most translators in, or, or, that we have in the chapter there, but really shouldn't in there, in my opinion, it shouldn't end the chapter 2 verse 3. Because <clears throat> then all of a sudden, verse 4, everything shifts again. Which is why if your Bible's written in paragraph form, it kind of looks that way. It kind of carries the paragraph into the next chapter. Um, when the Hebrews wrote this, by the way, excuse me, when it was originally written, when Moses wrote this, there wasn't any verse division or chapter division anyway. It's just one solid thought. In fact, there wasn't even sentence division. <clears throat> Thus the heavens and the earth were finished. We're in chapter 2. And all the host of them... And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he'd done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, made it holy, because on it, God rested from all the work that he'd done in creation. God delights in his creation. Folks, we, we live in a solar system, which is basically our sun and, and um, our eight planets, 
that has a diameter of approximately 7.5 billion miles. So that means if you get in your, uh, if you get a hold of Karsten and you get one of his space cars, and you get in that space car and drive 65 miles an hour around the clock, 24/7, if you will, it'll take you 13,172 years to get across our solar system. Now that's pretty big. <clears throat> And as large as that solar system is, it isn't anything compared to the galaxy, right? The Milky Way itself, which contains 100 billion stars just on our galaxy, and now scientists estimate 50 billion galaxies in the universe. And then we learn that our universe is continuing to expand in spatial dimension. Listen to these verses. Psalm 8.1 O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth! who has displayed thy splendor above the heavens. Psalm 97, 6. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people, all the people, see his glory. Psalm 108, 5. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth. Isaiah 44, 23. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth its singing, O mountains, O forests, and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and he will be glorified in Israel. Can you imagine that the God who spoke all of that into existence wants to reveal himself to you and me? God saw that what he had done was good. He declares it's good. He delights in what he did. And the seventh day is a very special day and is unique from all other days. Theologian Kenneth Matthew points out, let me list these four things about the uniqueness of this day, <clears throat> even in the written account. Number one, there is no creation formula. There is no phrase, and God said, that's been in all the other six days. Number two, there's no closing refrain. The phrase, and there was evening and there was morning. It's not in this one. It's not connected to this day. Verse, or number three, it's the only day God, the only day God blessed, specifically. Number four, there's no paired corresponding day like there was in all the others. Number five, unlike the other days, the number of the day is repeated three times. There's four lines in Hebrew, written in Hebrew, read it in Hebrew. Three of them are parallel, and each of them, each of the three, have seven words, and at the midpoint of each line is the phrase, the seventh day. This is the e easiest or best way I could say them in English. So God finished by the seventh day his work, which he did. Line one. Line two. And he rested on the seventh day from all the work, which he did. Line three. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified. Did you see that? There, in Hebrew, there's seven words in each of those three sentences. And the seventh day, that, that word, is in the center of every one of them. Is God highlighting something here? He's pointing something out. Folks, God was not tired. He wasn't, that was hard. <laughs> I'm Bush. I need a nap. Somebody give me some iced tea or something. I've got to keep my feet up for a while. He wasn't tired. <clears throat> wasn't tired at all. He was pleased. He was satisfied with what he did. And the word rest, the little Hebrew definition of the word means to cease from. It just means stop. <clears throat> to cease from. But here's what he stopped. Listen. He stopped his creative activity. God did not stop working. He's never stopped working. How do I know that? Jesus said in John 15, 7, My Father is working until now, and I am working. God never quits working around the clock. He doesn't need a nap. What this means is he just stopped making creation. That part of his work was finished. His blessing, it means, that he gave it a specific, special, spiritual significance. This day has spiritual significance. How? Because he called it something. This day is what? It's holy. Which means this is his day. And humanity was to focus on worshiping him. Sabbath... Is from Shabbat. What does Sabbath mean? What does a Shabbat mean? It means seven. Okay. 
This day for the Jewish people became a sign of the old covenant and the old law. And in that, first you work, then you rest. Work six, rest one. The principle of work and rest was to remind Israel that God is God and they are not. That, in other words, you cannot work without rest because you're not God. You've got to stop. <clears throat> it also reminded them that they were dependent on Him. That He's the one who made it. It was to point them back to the creative account and to remind them that He is creator and the ability they have to have life comes from Him. Now the New Testament church, so that was set aside for them as day of worship, if you will. The New Testament church sets aside the first day of the week in the New Testament as a picture of the new creation and the new covenant of grace. They did that since that's the day Jesus rose from the dead. Now remember the old covenant, first you work, then you rest. Listen, in the new covenant, first you believe in Christ and find rest, then you work. You rest in Jesus, then you work for Him. So they set aside this for that purpose. Sabbath means honoring and experiencing a, a sense of completeness and well-being that God accomplishes in giving us life for human life. The New Testament church gathered for the first day of worship and proclamation for the new creation. Of course, you can do that any and every day. Any day of the week. Why? I love this. This is the only day that has no end. Did you catch that? There's no closing refrain. <clears throat> We're still in the seventh day. He didn't close it. In other words, listen, our rest is in Jesus, the Creator and the Redeemer, and it's eternal. It does not stop. Moses is pointing out something. God didn't end this day. This day continues. Folks, we, we can and we should delight in what God has done for us and the involvement he, he has in our life as Jesus is our creator and our redeemer. We rest in him forever. Philippians 1.6, Paul said, I am confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it till the day of Jesus Christ. Involved in our life. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who is at work, where? Amen. In you, both to will and to work, for his good pleasure. Who are we? Mm -hmm. Who are we, and yet we are the crown of his creation. And he is the light of life. Let's pray. Father, what a powerful passage that reminds us not only of our Creator, but also of our Redeemer, also of our Savior. Lord, we are unworthy for you to have done so much to create us. And even more what you have done to save us in the death of our Lord and Savior. That Jesus, the Word, creative agent of the Trinity, he who scripture says created us, would become part of that creation and die on the cross. That even humble yourself enough, Lord, to become part of your creation, to become one of us, is an overwhelming thought. And yet you did. And you died. And you rose again. And when it's all said and done, sin will be no more. There will be no need for the Son, for you will be our life, and we will live forever in in your glory, by resting continually in you. Thank you, God, for the blessing, the blessing, the blessing of salvation. Thank you for the very breath we breathe. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.